Michael. Y'all sound so beautiful. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. So, what now? What do we do? As a result of, of this text, as a result of understanding the depth of God's ability to do the impossible, what does that mean for, for you and I? What does it require of us? I mean, if, if we're to pose the question that's asked in verse 14 of our text today, is anything impossible for God? The answer is a resounding no, nothing's impossible for God. Nothing. But do we really believe this truth in our lives today, when faced with the circumstances of life, do we really believe that? In 1967, a teenager named Joni Erickson took a dive that changed her life forever. And her story gives you and me vital insight into in how God deals with these kind of circumstances and works in those circumstances. Now her paralysis caused her to be, as you might imagine, very bitter. They caused her to be bitter. I mean, can you imagine being live and vibrant and, and athletic, and then all of a sudden, it's all cut short, and you're paralyzed. Of course, bitterness. But when she began to confront her paralysis, she was encouraged by her friends to take that to God. And to have faith that God could miraculously heal her. After all, nothing's impossible for God. Nothing, you see. But as she began to muster this faith, she struggled with the difference between the fact that God could heal her miraculously from her paralysis and the truth or reality of the fact of would he do it. You see, that's... That's the, that's the tension that exists. The, the fact that he could is never a question in our minds. The, the question is always, would he? But listen. How much faith would it take for her to believe that God would heal her spirit instead of her body? I mean, how, how, could, how, how could she possibly be of use to God in her circumstances of, of paralysis. But could he heal her spirit and use her in his service despite her physical limitations? I mean, doesn't God do an impossible thing when he uses an, a, you and I despite our physical limitations, despite our flawed nature, despite our flawed flesh? Isn't that a miracle that he uses you and I in the everyday circumstances of life as believers to further his kingdom despite our limitations. That indeed, my friends, is the true miracle. Is it not? I mean, if anyone would have told Joni that she'd become an internationally known mouth artist, author of a dozen best-selling books, an inspirational speaker that aired on over 800 radio stations internationally, she may have considered that that reality was far more impossible than just healing her paralyzed body. But that's what happened. That's what happened. As it happens, Joni's faith that God could transform her contributed far more to the kingdom than having her paralysis healed ever would. And isn't that what it's all about, really? It's not about you and I, is it? It's, it's about God using you and I to the furtherment of the kingdom of God. So my friends, my charge to you today is this. Given the circumstances of life, our God is fully able to deliver you from any hardship, to deliver you and I from any challenge, any struggle. But the question is not a question of will he. The question is, will he use you in those circumstances and will you allow yourself to be used in those circumstances to further his kingdom as a demonstration of your faith in God, as a demonstration of your faith that Jesus Christ is able to overcome the most wretched sinner that ever lived.
See, we need to be really careful that when we realize the truth of the fact that our God is able to perform any unbelievable task, any miracle that's possible, that we don't begin to dictate to him exactly how that's going to go. You know, I'm a victim of that sometimes. I, I, I take opportunity from time to time to work through all of the little details on how things are supposed to turn out. And then I work to that end, making sure that all of the doors are shut and all the paths are cleared and everything to work right on up to the outcome. And I derive tremendous pleasure when things turn out exactly the way that I had predicted them to do. And then I'm angry when they don't. Fail. You see, you and I are responsible for the process, my friends. But God is responsible for the product. When we read the text, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For... It is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That is the merging of your and my responsibility as believers to give every effort necessary to further the kingdom, knowing full well that the outcome is all on God. Do we have the courage to surrender that? Do we really believe that his way is the best way? Do we? Let's always make Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane our prayer. Do you remember it? You know, we call the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But really, the Lord's Prayer, my friends, is his prayer in the Garden when he, as, as he prayed ardently, and as the text tells us, he sweat as if they were great drops of blood. In other words, he was profusely sweating, knowing full well what he was in for. Spikes to be hammered through his wrists and his feet. A, a spear jabbed in his side. A crown of thorns hammered on his head. Beaten with rods. Whipped his flesh, ripped from his body. And if that wasn't the worst of it, as God Almighty to have the entire totality of the sins of humanity laid on him, the one thing he hates. And so Jesus prayed, let this cup, if possible, pass from me, but not my will, my humanity, he says, not my will, but your will be done. In other words, the grand design, the grand design of all of this existence is much more important than the next day or so of what I'm going to endure and suffer. And that, my friends, should be your and my prayer. The Lord's Prayer. Let this come pass, if it be your will, but not my will. Your will be done. Will you do it? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your perfect purposes in our lives. And we know that our God is able to do the impossible. To deliver. To provide. Father, help us to be surrendered to your outcome, to your product. Help us to be part of the process and to not just simply throw our hands up and say, well, you know, just, we'll just give it all to the Lord and, and just sit back and, and hope. Because hope is not a strategy. Help us to have the courage to stand up and say, I will give every effort to the end of glorifying you and furthering your kingdom. Use me as you see. Fill us with your spirit so we can accomplish these purposes. We pray all these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. For his sake. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Before we uh, break into our time of uh, invitation, I want to mention that uh, we have a very brief impromptu meeting after the service for our members. And so, if you will... Uh, as, as members uh, of our, our church, just hang back for just a few moments. We've got a couple things we need to quickly vote on, so I wanted to mention that to you. And now we come to a time of invitation. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you believe that Jesus is God, and that He came to earth, lived a perfect life as a man, shed His blood voluntarily on the cross as an atonement for your and my sins and the satisfaction of God's wrath and that he rose from the dead to prove who he is and he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of power. If you believe that, then you're a Christian. And you need to make that public. And you come.
come forward as we sing our invitation here. If you want to unite with this beautiful body of believers, if you want to join us in our quest to further the kingdom of God as a united body of believers, you come as we sing our invitation hymn. If you just want to come forward to the altars and pray, we do that as we sing, just as I am.